Arcanum of Steamworks and Magica Obscura is a CRPG made by Troika Games and released in 2001. Nowadays it is regarded as somewhat of a cult classic, like the other two games made by the studio before it got smothered in sleep by Activision, because making banger role-playing games on PC apparently puts a curse on you. However, unlike Temple of Elemental Evil and Bloodlines, this game was not based on an existing tabletop system and setting, but it was created from the ground up for the sake of the game, giving a truly unique experience in the role-playing landscape, for better and worse. I have attempted to play this game a few times prior, and I dropped it before finishing for a myriad of reasons. Once it ran like garbage and crashed constantly, another time I lost my most effective companion in the game due to a bug and didn't notice until I overwrote my save and it bumped me out too much to continue, and I almost dropped it again just a day before starting the script because my save file got corrupted right at the end of the game. Luckily, I had a spare one made a day or two back, so I just beelined the important stuff and finished it. So if you'd like to play the game for yourself, please install the unofficial patch linked below, and even then, please don't be me and rotate your saves regularly. And even then, when I tried to record it, I got a black screen, so stolen footage it is. But let's get to the game itself. <clears throat> The Industrial Revolution and its consequences have been a disaster for the realm of Arcanum. The previously boilerplate fantasy world of Arcanum is undergoing rapid technological advancements, changing one of the biggest cities on the continent from a feudal kingdom to a factory-filled, suit-covered, council-run megalopolis in just a few decades. With the scientific enlightenment, the world is changing for the better. Steam engines hiss, carrying tons of cargo along railroads cutting through previously empty fields. Factory production gave the common person access to amenities previously considered luxurious. The printing press lets everyone stay informed, and the history of the continent is uncovered and documented by brave archaeologists. The advent of gunpowder and firearms made a peasant capable of killing a fully armored noble. Anyone carrying magical items or possessing magical aptitude has to ride the back of the train. Orcs and ogres are enslaved by law and tolling in the facto- wait, hold up. I think I don't need to introduce the idea of steampunk to any of you, but I always had an issue with treating that word as a setting descriptor. More often than not, it is an aesthetic more than anything. And I do not mind it due to its anachronisms. Slapping cogs on a top hat worn by a sharpshooter with a revealing outfit is about as true to life as a viking fighting against a knight in full plate armor, fucking go for it. But at the same time, being only an aesthetic made steampunk feel shapeless and toothless, so I never really gravitated towards it, unless it was a drawing of some crazy Jules Verne-esque contraption. So something being rooted in this steampunk aesthetic was never a point of quality for me when looking at stuff. Just a side note. Arcanum fully embraces both the wonder and horror of the Industrial Revolution. Sure, you get a cool zeppelin, but also a two-volume treatise on the orcish question and a description of a child losing his hand to the gears of a factory when trying to unclog a machine. All of that on top of a world full of history with past grudges, stereotypes and war. Arcanum remembers that a revolution is exactly that, a sudden upset of a previous status quo, often implementing changes much faster than things like morality and common sense can catch up. And the previous status quo was not just medieval fuckery, it was magical medieval fuckery. Dragons and knights, mages and elves, they're still around, but suddenly diminished. What was previously the defining feature of the known world became nothing in the span of a single human lifespan. That life being one of Gilbert Bates, the person responsible for kickstarting the revolution with his steam engine. For you see, in the game's masterstroke of world building, magic and science are opposites. Technology relies on natural constants like conservation of energy and such. Getting a steam engine relies as much on math as it does on engineering, especially if you want it to run constantly. Meanwhile, magic warps those principles, creating fire from nothing and such. So, a mage in a set of steam power armor is either gonna break it or implode, as technology also subtly reinforces the strength of those natural laws and acts as a magic nullifier, and the effect is stronger the more complex the machinery is. 
So as I said before, the locomotive might be a wondrous invention, but anyone flinging spells has to ride as far away from the engine as possible, if at all, for the safety of everyone on board, including themselves. Or those less adept might just find themselves unable to work anymore because a town got a mechanized printing press and suddenly their spells are much less reliable. This is the world your character is dropped into in a crashing Zeppelin. Being a passenger on the maiden voyage of IFS Zephyr, you don't have enough time to realize that the launch is eerily similar to the one on the Titanic before two biplanes shoot it down. One of the other passengers, a gnome, tells you to find a boy and gives you a ring before dying. Then you are found by Virgil, a young acolyte of the Panari religion who is stunned by the whole affair, as your miraculous survival matches their legend of elf Jesus coming back to Earth almost one to one. He's new to this whole thing and can't tell you much, so the adventure begins to help you figure out who you are, what your role in the whole thing is, and what to do of it all. And then assassins show up trying to make sure you don't get those answers. You can, of course, approach this with a healthy dose of skepticism, because come on, sure, magic is real, but did we put aside all the other superstitions in this age of intellect? Speaking of intellect, let's talk about character creation. You're given a wide array of options when it comes to your character's species and background, but regardless of what you do, you're going to be laughably inept at level 1. All your base stats start at 8, a level giving you penalties, and you have 5 points to spare. The same points are spent for learning spells, skills and technological schematics, and with a level cap at 50, at least without the unofficial patch, don't expect to be a jack of all trades and choose a character concept to stick to. If you are pumping enough charisma to have a small warband of followers to follow you, don't expect to excel in combat, and so on. Additionally, all the stats give you a bonus benefit when you hit the cap at 20. Maximum perception, you see invisible things. Maximum strength, your melee damage is doubled, and so on and so forth. With that said, the specific paths you can take are really interesting. Starting with skills, they all have three tiers of upgrades you can learn from people around the world. Pretty much every guard can make you an apprentice in swinging a sword, but a master of it is always a single NPC, and getting training from them always involves a quest. Wanna be a master persuader? Go negotiate a truce between two kingdoms. Want the master of sneaking to teach you? Fucking find him! It's such a great idea and really makes the last step feel like something special. Then there's the various schools of magic and technology. Someone versed in white necromancy can go from healing to resurrecting, but the same goes for herbalists. Rather than cast spells, you can create items of those properties. Your alignment is tracked across a binary scale. The more magic you know, the more likely it is a gun is gonna explode in your hand, and vice versa. The more apt with sciences you get, the bigger the chance that a healing spell won't work on you. Contrary to the portrayal in most RPGs, playing a mage is much more straightforward than a technologist. You unlock a new tool that you can use whenever, whereas crafting always requires you to find two specific ingredients. There is cool stuff you can create, like a Tesla zapper rod, or an army of machines that don't add to your party limit, but contrary to your first instincts, I would recommend starting with a mage or a neutral fighter or something. Especially because the guns, aside from the endgame ones like the elephant gun, fucking suck combat-wise. Yeah, sure, let's slap a minimum strength requirement on a ranged weapon, because it's realistic, then fuck off. The real meat here is how the character creation choices will influence your game going forward. Sure, you might expect to have an elf turn up his nose on you when you decide to play a dwarf, but I sure hope you're ready to suffer consistent, systemic racism aimed at you when playing a half-orc or a half-ogre. Get asked to leave a bar, pay more for lodging, have people constantly belittle your intellect, and that's on top of the usual dump dialogue that you can expect from the people that previously worked on Fallout 1 and 2. You ain't gonna get special treatment just cause you're a protagonist. Except maybe from Virgil, but even he has his limits. Unfortunately, once you get to the game proper, the combat sucks and there's no way to frame it politely. There are two modes, real-time and turn-based, and they do not represent each other at all. An enemy that can be easily handled at a distance in real time because their animations are sluggish suddenly have a ton of action points in turn based and close the distance immediately. There is enemies made out of rock or fire that damage your weapon when you hit them or damage your armor when they hit you. The companion AI is... Well, let's just say I had mages run into fights swinging fists very often and no way to corral them, officially worse than Persona 3. And the fights go by so fast and chaotic that there's very little satisfaction to be had ever, so... Why the hell did I return to this game three times? 
because holy shit, even with all its flaws, this is probably the best representation of what it feels like to play a tabletop game with a strong emphasis on exploration as the main tool of problem solving. The capital of Unified Kingdom, Tarant, is still the most impressive city ever put into an RPG, not just because of its scale and density, but due to the little touches like all the streets being named and having you find an address is a part of several quests, paper boys having new headline to shout every day, and an active thieves guild that can offer you a bunch of quests to just steal otherwise pointless objects from houses of rich people. The game never really holds your hand regarding finding stuff, and it feels amazing when you figure things out. Granted, my forgetful ass did look into a guide at least on a few occasions. Don't know what to do in a new location? Go to a bar, get a drink and ask the bartender for the latest rumors. Wanna scan the room to see who is important? Nope, everyone is marked as something like Elf Noble until you talk to them. Just walking to your new destination? Oh look, there's an abandoned altar for a long forgotten pagan deity. Need to figure out who killed the guy? Drag his spirit back to earth with necromantic powers and ask! The game is not very verbose, but just gives you amazing depth of exploration and play, fitting for a setting modeled after the Age of Discovery. Despite being light on dialogue and interactions, the writing itself is smart, though the world takes precedence over any actual characters. You'll talk about dwarven philosophy, find people buying out elven sacred grounds without asking them first, discuss the inner workings of a long-lost necromantic cult with an undead warrior, all the good stuff. It is a bit of a shame, because when characters in your party do interact, there are some amazing pop-offs, but again, they are more focused on history and culture rather than personality traits. And I definitely wish that some characters of extreme story importance like Don Frog, the goddamn half-orc union leader, got more than some mentions and a single side quest to them. In a dream that will never be, I see the cancelled sequel, Journey to the Center of Arcanum, standing firm on the amazingly strong foundation of the world from the first game created and building more out of it. But alas, what we got instead was Vampire Bloodlines, which... You know, I'm definitely not complaining, that's one of my favorite games of all time, but man, what could have been. And on that notion, I do have some theories, ones I have not seen discussed before, but delving into them requires discussing some concepts that are spoilery, including the final talk you can have with the antagonist of the story that you're chasing for the vast majority of the main plotline, so, you know, warning to the wise. If you want to avoid it, set your chronometers to the time now displayed on the screen. Just make sure there are no wizards nearby or they will screw up the clock mechanism. Alright, so I think I know where the story would go in the second game, based on ideas seeded in the first title. It's not the Half Ogre Island quest. While this might have played a bigger role, you gotta understand that this side quest was a love letter to X-Files, a government conspiracy that is undefeatable, with a gnome who is in the know but against it, implied to be the one who gave your quest givers information to begin with, being an allegory of Deep Throat, the informant helping Mulder and Scully, but still keeping the cards close to his chest because of how much is at stake. Not to mention, making said conspiracy racial and having gnomes be bankers and industrialists while also being the shadowy power brokers treating other species like cattle is… uh, drawing unfortunate parallels to real-life conspiracy theories, let's say. No, the core of Arcanum is the idea of cycles and wrongly assuming one part of them is superior to the other. There's obviously the idea of technology and magic, cycling in prominence, rising to the top to then wane and give way to the other. Then there's Kergan wrongly assuming that the ideal end state of everything is death and blissful afterlife, combined with the existing notion of reincarnation and souls returning to new bodies after some time, like with the prophecy of Nazardin coming back. Sure, the prophecy is fake, but the idea was most likely not. Kergan even mentions souls not wanting to come back from the afterlife, and I don't think it's just black necromancy doing that. Then there's the pagan gods separated into three interlocking circles, and if you give all of them an offering in the proper order, you can receive game-breakingly strong buffs. And finally, there is the irritating obligatory puzzle that implies a cyclical connection between all schools of magic, channeling into a single focal point. The fact that this puzzle is part of the main plotline, unless you're willing to do a genocide, is what put me on this train of thought. Sure, a circle showing up once may be a coincidence, but this many times? 
This was a design choice. And it bleeds over to some other bits and pieces, like the royal clan of dwarves being the wheel clan, or the elven philosophy centering on the idea that all things, even bad ones, have their place in the bigger picture of the universe, as opposed to the elven supremacy of their dark counterpart. Both with the pagan god side quest and the magic puzzle, there is a center point that all the cycles feed into. In the former case, it is the creator deity, to whom you need to offer yourself to get resurrected stronger than ever after properly cycling through all his children. In the latter case, it's the symbol which does not correspond to any school of magic available in-game, and which stands alone, not surrounded by any symbols like the other four. In both instances, alluding to the idea that there is more to the cycles than the monotonous back and forth of a weight spinning at the end of a string. A perfect crossing point, at which everything is in balance. Then, there's the Age of Legends. While it's easy to think that it was dominated by magic due to how it is portrayed by most characters in the game, it was not that. It's just the information that was left, history written by victors and such. Because at the same time as Nazardin, Aronax, Kergan and the rest of the merry magical menagerie, there was the civilization of Vendigroth, capable of technological wonders that are unthinkable to the contemporary minds. It was not the age of magic so ever present that technology was impossible. Both sides of the coin were capable of miracles that are impossible at the point when the game starts. It was a state of equilibrium. And it seems it was reached at least a few times, with the void at the end being a magical plane littered with remains of a technologically advanced civilization. Whatever the heck happened there, it's clear that both sides can coexist. And would you believe it, in an interview with RPG Codex, Tim Kane said that journey to the center of Arcanum would involve, aside from a titular trip to the bowels of the planet, a clue about how magic and tech can be reconciled in the same artifact, something that most learned people had believed to be impossible. It was a journey both to the physical center of the planet and the metaphysical center of the cycle of magic and technology, a point in the wheel where all the spokes intersect. Or at least, that's what I think. My fury on a game that will never be and it breaks my heart. Hello again, fellow technologists! I hope your stay was pleasant and your pocket watch is precise, because I'm not gonna keep this on for long, I just want to impart some final thoughts. I obviously recommend this game. It's janky, broken and buggy, but it has unprecedented amounts of soul, and I genuinely think it's the best take on steampunk that exists, unless you want to be an asshole and throw books that were called science fiction in the 19th century at me. It's insanely replayable due to the amount of moving parts and variables that you can play around with, and has some of the best world building the medium ever had to offer and is, to this day, a joy to experience. And if there is a shameless bootleg tabletop system based on it, please let me know. I hope people more creative than me come across it and it serves as a spark for them because damn, I want to love steampunk almost as much as I already love cyberpunk and having more works like this out there would definitely help. Extra! Extra! A man breaks promises made in a previous video due to being easily influenced by others. The previously mentioned videos will still come, but at an unspecified time frame. The staff of Last Minute SS apologizes for their boss being a stupid idiot. The printing presses can keep running thanks to generous sponsorship of Patreon supporters listed on this page, as well as coffee donations like the one listed next to them. We would like to thank our new patron, Nev, for his trust in our abilities to deliver the most last minute of essays. To everyone else, thank you, and remember, nothing gets you a hastily written essay like a subscription.